Hello, my name is John Swales. Welcome to the second session of the course Climate Justice Following Jesus in a World of Climate Breakdown. Before we get on to today's material, let's just hear again the words of the Beatitudes from the First Nations version. When Creator sets free, Jesus saw this great crowd. He went back up into the mountainside and sat down to teach the people. His followers came to him there, so he took a deep breath, opened his mouth and began to share his wisdom with them and teach them how to see Creator's good road. Creator's blessing rests on the poor, the ones with broken spirits. The good road from above is theirs to walk. Creator's blessing rests on the ones who walk a trail of tears, for he will wipe the tears from their eyes and comfort them. Creator's blessing rests on the ones who walk softly and in a humble manner. The earth, land and sky will welcome them and always be their home. Creator's blessing rests on the ones who hunger and thirst for wrongs to be made right. They will eat and drink until they are full. Creator's blessing rests on the ones who are merciful and kind to others. Their kindness will find its way back to them, full circle. Creator's blessing rests on the pure of heart. They are the ones who will see the Great Spirit. Creator's blessing rests on the ones who make peace. It will be said of them, they are the children of the Great Spirit. Creator's blessing rests on the ones who are hunted down and mistreated for doing what is right, for they are walking the good road from above. Others will lie about you, speak against you, and look down on you with scorn and contempt all because you walk the road with me. This is a sign that Creator's blessing is resting on you. So let your hearts be glad and jump for joy. For you'll be honoured in the spirit world above. You are like the prophets of old who were treated in the same way by your ancestors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And these are the words of Jesus. Creator's blessing uh, rests on those who walk a trail of tears, or in a translation you're perhaps used to, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And perhaps as we are exploring climate breakdown, there's a sense of grief and of loss and of mourning, which is completely natural and human. And Jesus reminds us in this passage that divine favour and blesses and blessing rests on those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And the truth we have as Christians is that the darkest day is not the final day. So why don't we begin with a, a prayer? Father of compassion, creator God, we thank you that we gather together as your sons and daughters. We thank you for the world that you have made, for soils and streams and mountains and music, flowers and fauna, laughter and love, dancing and daffodils, flamingos and food. We thank you that we inhabit this world with non-human worshippers, Elephants and eagles, red kites and raccoons, monkeys and macaws. To you be all honour, glory and praise. Father of creation, God of compassion. We are concerned about this world of yours and this world of ours. It is our home. In the face of the climate crisis, our hearts are restless and our souls are sad. Draw near to us as the healer of all hurts. 
Father, we ask that you would lead and guide us by the power and compassion of the Holy Spirit. In these strange and difficult days, we ask that you would mould us and shape us into the image of your Son and our Saviour Jesus. May we, like him, be people of justice. So come, Holy Spirit. We need you. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh. Come, Holy Spirit. Empower us, even as we go through this teaching material together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today's session is entitled Just Jesus, Enacting the Kingdom in a World of Climate Breakdown. In the last session, we looked at the story we find ourselves in, and we live in a story in which God is in the business of the reconciliation of all things, a story in which love wins, a story in which the heart and love of God has been revealed clearly to us in the person and work of Jesus. Through the gift of the Spirit, we are called to look and love like Jesus in embodying and enacting his love, a love which is outworked in both justice and compassion. Tragically, we also know that we live in another story, the story of climate breakdown. Through the continued use of fossil fuels, temperatures continue to rise and suffering is locked in. We're already at 1.2 degrees above pre-industrial levels and unless things change dramatically, we will head into a two degrees world. A world which will include mass migration, mass starvation and societal collapse. Tonight, well, in this session, we are going to dig deeper into both of these stories. We will begin with Jesus and then take a look at the economic forces and inequalities which plunge us further into climate breakdown. As we look at the material from the Gospels, I want us to be thinking what this might mean, what are the implications for our own missional engagement in the context of climate breakdown. Likewise, when we look at the economic fire forces which are driving us further into climate breakdown, I want us to be making connections with what we have gathered about King Jesus and his kingdom ministry. Over the next few moments, we're going to look at Jesus in his historical context. And we are going to find that in him is, is not to be found a timid morality which retreats from the world into a spiritualizing irrelevance. No, in him we find a kingdom call to courageous engagement and transformative cross-bearing. It is this radical vision of Jesus that can make us feel uncomfortable. Because he challenges our dominative, dominant narratives of comfort. Challenges our risk aversion. Challenges our individualism. And he offers a fresh vision and imagination of what it is to be followers of the Father in a world of injustice. He makes us feel uncomfortable, but we shouldn't be surprised by this. He did, after all, say, whoever wants to be my disciple must take up his cross and follow me. Now, the historical Jesus, he wasn't an Anglican, a Brit, or a Canadian. Nor was Jesus a climate activist. He wasn't left wing or right wing. And so as not to make Jesus in our own image, we need to, need to understand the historical context of his ministry. Understand Jesus as a historical figure. Whilst volumes of books have been written about first century Palestine at the time of Jesus, I want to focus in on, one, on just one aspect, that of the economy. You see, Jesus lived in a world of economic oppression. In Jesus' day, many were hungry. Half the hang harvest had been t may have been taken as tax. Many were in debt in an economy which favoured the rich and those in collusion with the empire, the emperor, or his client kings. 
Recent scholarship has suggested that in Jesus' day, most of the wealth was in the hands of a few, but the vast majority of the population were at or near subsistence level, whose primary concern it was was to obtain the minimum food, shelter and clothing necessary to sustain life. Their lives were dominated by the struggle for physical survival. Jesus lived in what scholars call an agrarian aristocratic empire, an agricultural system, but it was an empire. And the empire had two essential tasks, that of military control and economic exploitation. One to two percent of the ruling class owned most of the land and wealth. 70 to 80 percent of the population were peasants. Wealth had been accumulated into the hands of a few. If you take a look at the uh, diagram on the screen there, you can see this uh, onion shape, and this is sort of a, a rough guide. Uh, you know, we see that numbers wise, most people live below the poverty line, they were either destitute or peasants. And then minority were rich landowners, traders, the ruling elites with the Roman emperor at the top. And the higher you get up in this, the more power you have, the more wealth and the more status you have. This bears some parallels with our global situation, our contemporary global situation. According to a 2018 UN report, the 26th richest people in the world hold as much wealth as half of the global population. So the 26th richest people in the world hold as much wealth as the 3.8 billion poorest people. Well, back to Jesus. Where does Jesus fit into this economic context of oppression and domination? Uh, did Jesus bring a religion which offered distraction from the pain and suffering in people's lives? And did Jesus simply focus on uh, the spiritual, uh, my kingdom is not of this world, without any interest in the economic and political situation in which people found themselves? This is the kind of religion that the empire likes. As Karl Marx said, religion is an opiate of the people. And by offering eternal life, does does it mean that Jesus necessarily downgrades the need for social and political revolution or reform? If the church follows this Jesus, then perhaps uh, they're concerned primarily with afterlife affairs and sin management, a spiritual Jesus, then it can be easy for the church to be, become a, a chaplain and a cheerleader for the status quo. Throughout church history, we have seen through slavery, conquistadors and nationalism, how the church in many times and many places becomes part of the problem rather than the solution. On the other hand, did Jesus follow his zealot comrades in seeking to violently overthrow those in power and bring about a new world order? Jesus, the revolutionary, the crusader who takes up the sword to bring about rapid societal change and overthrow the systems of domination. These are interesting historical questions, but they also have relevance to our own context. We don't live in an agrarian aristocratic society, but we too live in a world of domination and oppression. This is seen particularly in the story of climate breakdown. How should the church as followers of Jesus position itself? Should the church assume an apolitical position which doesn't rock the boat in terms of politics and economics, which in itself reinforces the narratives of the status quo? Or as temperatures rise, and we see, and we will see sadly in 
parts of the world, violent uprisings seeking to overthrow uh, the fossil fuel capitalist economies. Would the church advocate, would it ever advocate joining a violent revolution? Well, Jesus, as we shall see, he offers a third way. Jesus brings a non-violent kingdom movement, which does indeed have political and economic consequences. Jesus is bringing a kingdom revolution which challenges the status quo and the forces of domination. So as we begin to look at Jesus, we may well know that Jesus uh, spent a lot of time announcing and enacting the kingdom of God, the reign and the rule of God. In his excellent book, Jesus the Peacemaker, the Roman Catholic Terence Rain maintains the church should note that the central teaching and consuming passion of Jesus is the kingdom of God, a profoundly political term that calls people to face the problems of the world, not despair from the world or flee from it. So the kingdom of God is a is a political term. It, it concerns kingship and reign and ruling. We might say it's the government of God. Uh, the phrase the kingdom of God is used over 120 times in the Gospels and is central to the ministry of the historical Jesus. Here are a few examples. At the beginning of Mark and Matthew's Gospel, Jesus' opening sermon is this, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel so that the, the kingdom of God is, is arriving, it's breaking in the present and people need to change their way of living and believe this good news. In Luke chapter 6 in the Beatitudes, uh, Jesus says this, um, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. In Luke chapter it these are just examples of how kingdom of god language is used in the gospels soon afterwards jesus went through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of god and the 12 were with him notice here that the, the kingdom of god is something that is proclaimed but it's also something that's brought it's something that's enacted and in the prayer that jesus taught us we also get uh, reference to the kingdom in Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, we read, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom go come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The assumption here is that God's will is not being done on the earth. And so that's where God's kingdom needs to come to bear. Well, what is the kingdom of God? Well, the kingdom of God isn't the hope of heaven when you die, nor is it to be equated with the church, and both of these things are uh, important, but that isn't what the kingdom is. Rather, the kingdom of God is the dream and the hope that the values, culture, and life of the coming age would break into the present, into all spheres of life, including the political, social, and economic. In Jesus, the king, this kingdom is not just proclaimed, it is enacted. In Jesus, the kingdom is inaugurated and in his glorious return, it will be consummated. We pray, as we've just uh, been reading, let your kingdom come, your will be done, because this world is not the way it is meant to be. Many within more charismatic traditions in the church have rightly seen that the kingdom draws near in personal healing. In Jesus, we're reminded that the kingdom is both this and more. We may say that the kingdom is the opposite of what breaks God's heart. In a world of guilt, the kingdom is forgiveness. In a world of violence, the kingdom is shalom. In a world of marginalisation of the poor, Jesus welcomes the weak, gathers the oppressed. In a world of loneliness, the kingdom is community. But in all these aspects, the kingdom is in and through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom, which is a deeply political concept, is thus both an invitation and a challenge. 
It's an invitation for all to participate and perform with fresh hope and imagination. However, the kingdom is also a challenge to oppressive forces of domination and injustice. Well, let's advance what we might may call a kingdom activist hypothesis by drawing a few more comments from the Gospels. Let's begin with Mary's song of praise, the Magnificat. In Luke 4, Mary, in advance of Jesus' birth, offers us some further clues about what the kingdom is. The Magnificat, otherwise known as Mary's Song, offers us a revolutionary picture of the great reversal. So let me read it to you. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has looked upon the humble state of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him, from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones, he has exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. In verse 55, we see that the kingdom, which Mary is celebrating, is tied in with the story of Israel. Going back to Genesis uh, 12, God's... uh, plan is that in Abraham and his descendants all the nations of the world will be blessed. Uh, uh, The God of Israel, Yahweh, is not a tribal deity but he will act for all the nations and Mary here is saying that's that's come about here. But notice the great reversal which we find in verses 52 and verse 53. In verse 52, he addresses power. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Go back to the onion diagram we had before. Those who are at the top end, they're going to be brought down. And those who are at the bottom, the peasants and those in destitution will be lifted up. Verse 3, 53, addresses destitution he has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away mary here is she's so excited that almost she's like the kingdom is here is in its fullness and what does it look like the hungry are fed those in destitution are fed but also there's a leveling Uh, the rich now are humbled verse 53 It addresses wealth. So Mary's song here addresses power, addresses destitution, and addresses wealth. Ryan Kuja, who's a part of Red Letter Christians, he says this, let there be no mistake, Marian doxology invites revolution. And for 2,000 years, Mary's words have been regarded as a threat to, to many of those in power, to dictators, to autocrats. During the British colonial administration in India and in El Salvador and Guatemala in the 1980s, Christians weren't allowed to read or sing her words. They were prohibited. In Argentina, her words were outlawed during the period which is known as the Dirty War era. For Mary, the kingdom is one of revolution in which there are political and economic consequences. 
We may say then that Mary's song offers a provocative kingdom hope that the current forces of domination and oppression manifested in political and, and economic systems and embodied in day-to-day -day destitution are going to be overturned in and through her son. The one who is to be born is an agent of radical social change. In this context, but perhaps there's also a message for us today. Jesus, in his ministry, speaks uncomfortable words to those who have been the winners in the structures of domination. It seems here that what Mary anticipated, Jesus enacts. Jesus says this, Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. That's Luke chapter 6 verse 24. He tells the rich young ruler, who perhaps had acquired his wealth and accumulated wealth at the expense of others. He said, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. Rabbi Jesus, who himself had nowhere to lay his head, says, do not store riches up for yourself here on earth. That's in Matthew chapter 6, verse, verse 19. And he also says how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This isn't Marxism, leftism, socialism, or communism. These are the words of Jesus. Now, in Matthew and Mark's gospel, Jesus' opening words are, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. And it's very likely that Luke, when he's writing his gospel, has Mark in front of him. So he's reading that Jesus' first words in Mark's gospel are, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the good news. But he decides to do something different in his gospel. He takes them to one of Jesus' first sermons in a, a synagogue in Nazareth. And in Luke 4, Jesus unrolls a scroll and he reads from Isaiah a powerful prophetic passage. If Jesus were a politician, this would be his manifesto. If Jesus were president, this would be an outline of his policies. Perhaps Luke here is trying to say, you know what, I know about the kingdom, let me give you a story from Jesus which unpacks what it's like. And this passage, just like the Magnificat, points to the reign and rule of God. It describes what it looks like. Jesus stood up to read and the scroll of Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then Luke tells us that Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of everyone were fastened on him and then Jesus began by saying, Today this scripture has been fulfilled. The kingdom manifesto is now being fulfilled. And the kingdom includes good news to the poor, freedom to the oppressed. It includes healing. But note, it also says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Most commentators rightly point out that Jesus here is drawing on Isaiah. But Isaiah is also drawing on the Jubilee traditions of Leviticus chapter 25. If you're watching this video and you're able, do press pause now and read Leviticus 25. Um, 
and just ask yourself what it is saying. Now, a bit of uh, a bit of context um, in the Old Testament world, which is very different to our world. Land was allotted to uh, f- tribes and families in Kenya. Got allotted pieces of land, and Leviticus Leviticus twenty five is offering a certain law which would happen on the fiftieth year. Leviticus 25 says this, And you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. So every 50 years you do something uh, different. The 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines. Let's just pause there. That's an interesting one, isn't it? You let the land rest. You let the land rest every 50 years. Um, that's, it. that's interesting, that, isn't it? Let's continue. Uh, verse 12. For it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field uh, when land is sold because of debts. But if he does not have sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee it shall be released and he shall return to his property. When your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, you shall not make him serve as a slave. He shall be with you as a hired worker and as a sojourner. He will serve with you until the year of Jubilee. The notion here is that... uh, this land which was allotted to people, as time went on, sometimes people would send, sell their land because they ended up in debt and wealth would become accumulated into hands of a few. Or people would become debt slayers where they come and work for others. But this uh, law in Leviticus is saying that every 50 years there would be an economic reset. There'd be the cancellation of debt there'd be the redistribution of land. And this prevented the accumulation of capital into the hands of a few. And there'd be freedom for those who had become debt slaves. Gordon Wenham, uh, Old Testament scholar, who taught me Hebrew when I was training in Bristol. He said this, Had the Jubilee been observed, such unbridled exploitation of the poor would have been checked. Leviticus 25 prohibits anyone from selling himself or his land off permanently. In effect, he may only rent out his land or his labour for a maximum of 49 years. The Jubilee was intended to prevent the accumulation of the wealth of the nation in the hands of a few. Every Israelite had an inalienable right to his family land and to his freedom. If he lost them through falling into debt, he recovered them in the Jubilee. The biblical law, I'm still quoting from Gordon Wenham here, (coughs) in his commentary on the book of Leviticus, he says this, the biblical law is opposed equally to the monopolistic monopolistic tendencies of unbridled capitalism and for a growing communism where all property is in state hands. By keeping land within a particular family, the Jubilee also promoted family unity. So, where have we got to here? Jesus in his first sermon is reading from the book of Isaiah and he's saying, these things have been fulfilled in me. Uh, This is what the kingdom looks like. And part of what the kingdom looks like is bringing about the uh, favourable day of the Lord, the Jubilee from Leviticus 25. Scholarship tells us that this was never put into practice by the people of Israel. And, you know, so wealth was becoming accumulated into the hands of the few and Jesus turns up and he says... Now is the acceptable year of the Lord. The kingdom dream 
which Jesus outlines in Luke 4, includes that of wealth redistribution. It is an economic reset. The kingdom thereby has social, political and economic aspects. A time when debt is cancelled and any land which has been bought and sold in the last 50 years will be returned to its owner. It seems that Jesus is saying that the kingdom has an explicit economic aspect in which wealth is to be redistributed. Perhaps that's why in the uh, book of Acts, when the Spirit comes, the church, those who had resources, sold them and it was redistributed to those in need. In our own day, and we're going to get to this in a bit, much of the wealth of nations and individ individuals has been accumulated over generations, sometimes been linked to colonialism, slavery and un unethical exploitation. The rich can get richer over generations. It is this wealth and inequality which we'll see is deeply unjust in regard to climate breakdown. The ones who suffer the most in climate breakdown too often have the least and their suffering is related to the lifestyles of the rich. And Jesus, 2,000 years ago, declares a jubilee, he says the economic reset is here. The activist Jesus is advocating an economic system which no doubt, you know, the poor welcomed him, but upset those in power. It put him on a crash course with the rulers and powers of his age. Andrea Trockmy, in his book, Jesus and the Nonviolent Revolution. Uh, and if you do get a moment, just uh, Google the life of Andrea Trockmy. He was a, a pastor who discipled his, who advocated nonviolence, lived during the Second World War, but pastored his congregation, discipled them, so that when the uh, Nazis and those who worked with them started to round up the Jews, his community, his parish, his church hid them and even went to prison because of this. Anyway, after the Second World War, he wrote this little book, which I think it's available as a free PDF online, and it's called Jesus and the Nonviolent Revolution. Let me just pick up where he's talking about the Jubilee. Jesus' revolution drew its strength from God's liberating justice. By proclaiming the Jubilee, Jesus wanted to bring about a total social transformation with an eye to the future yet based on the vision of justice God had already set forth in the past. When Jesus proclaimed good news to the poor, liberty to the captives and sight to the blind, his audience knew very well what he meant. Now is the time to put into effect the year of Jubilee. Jesus' speech in Nazareth, Nazareth was no sermon of religious platitudes. He was announcing that a social revolution was underway. The messianic reign had begun. For the poor, this was good news. All things would be made right again. For those whose interests were vested in the establishment, however, such news was a threat. During this brief exploration of the historical Je Jesus, we have learned about his kingdom vision, which carries significant political and social implications. This vision suggests that as followers of King Jesus, we are called to participate in the mission of overturning unjust structures and systems, promoting equality and redistributing wealth. At the very least, least this means that as a church, we must speak out against exploitative economic and political forces. We should not act as chaplains or cheerleaders for the present day. Any present day economic forces that are driving us further into climate breakdown. Perhaps also, if we take Jesus seriously, we would consider ourselves part of the non violent conspiracy of compassion that seeks to bring about a new world, a kingdom that is characterized by justice and compassion. So, what we've done in that first section there is to look at. Uh, look at Jesus, 
see the uh, the powerful uh, radical vision which he offers um which really suggests that as a church we shouldn't be apolitical no we should be involved in uh seeking to oppose injustice so let's move from the historical jesus and start thinking about how the kingdom can be enacted in our own generation a generation which stands at the hinge of history so i just want to introduce you to uh two documents here the first one comes from a court case the next one is from an ipc report in 2019 phil kingston aged 85 uh, there he is with his flat cap on um, with his hand on a train there he glued his hand to a train in the financial district of the city of london while reverend sue parfit aged 79 and father newell aged 55 they climbed onto the train's roof and offered prayers for the planet despite causing a 70 minute delay they were acquitted by a jury because their actions were deemed proportional to their right to protest. While we may have differing opinions uh, in this class about the ethics of civil disobedience and whether, even if we support civil disobedience, whether this is an appropriate way of doing that. Um, by the way, we're going to explore all of this in the later session. Let me share with, with you the facts that were agreed upon by both the prosecution and the judge. So there's the agreed facts at the court case that were not part of the defence. Let me read this uh, to you. The IPCC, United Nations body established in 1988 to assess the science related to climate change, estimated that to have a 66% chance of avoiding heating of 1.5 global emissions would have to be reduced by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. However, instead of falling, emissions have continued to grow in the following three years. So that's number one, you know, emissions arriving. Number two, the fossil fuel industry is the principal driver of climate change. The government provides subsidies of 10.5 billion per annum to the fossil fuel industry. Number three, the fossil fuel industry depends on the financial services and insurance industries which fund and guarantee its operations. All of these are headquartered in the City of London. And then it names some of the uh, banks which are bankrolling the fossil fuel industry, namely Barclays, and started a chanted, uh, standard chartered. Now, number four, climate change is a clear and imminent threat to human civilization. It has become increasingly widely recognised that immediate substantial action needs to be taken in order to uh, stabilise the climate at a temperature in which we can avoid massive and widespread loss of life. So the UK court has agreed that um, f fossil fuel emissions present a clear and imminent threat to human civilization and that immediate action is needed to stabilize things it also recognizes that the fossil fuel industry is the primary driver of this let's switch now to the ipcc report from 2022 The IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, is a scientific body made up of hundreds of scientists and experts from all around the world who volunteer their time to assess the latest research on climate change and produce reports that are widely used by policymakers. The IPCC's reports are based on a comprehensive review of the peer reviewed scientific literature and a subject, subject to extensive review and scrutiny by experts and governments uh, that they are actually very conservative in nature. And in 2022, in their report, they say this, targeting a climate-resilient, sustainable world 
involves fundamental changes to how society functions, including changes to underlying values, worldviews, ideologies, social structures, political and economic systems, and power relationships. This is actually quite a remarkable statement here from such a conservative organisation. Essentially saying if we want a livable future to avoid runaway climate breakdown and worst case scenarios, we need a fundamental shift in how society functions. We need to rebuild civilization, and this includes political and economic systems, and we have to do it quickly. We have to do it quickly. Um, the agreed facts in the UK courts and the IPC seem to agree that economic business as usual, fossil fuel capitalism, economic business as usual will lead to civilization collapse. We're going to dig into this a little bit <coughs> deeper. But I just want to and so let's just do a little bit of theology, which uh, doesn't have all the footnotes to it, but just gets us thinking. In Ephesians, the Apostle Paul talks about powers and principalities being at work in the world. He says that we need to engage in spiritual warfare to address the forces that have taken humanity hostage and blinded us to the truth. In the book of Revelation, John challenges the dominant narrative of his age, the Pax Romana, the Empire and the Emperor. For John, all that glitters is not gold, and the empire built on the edge of the swords, on the edge of swords and the back of slaves, is described in the book of Revelation as a beastly force which has seduced the world. For John the seer, these beastly forces should be resisted by those who have pledged allegiance to the Lamb. In our own day, I want to suggest that there are dark and strange forces at work. Which are literally plunging us further into climate breakdown. Deeply dehumanising forces because they actually pose an existential threat. And we are being seduced by these forces. Um, by what I... I said it's called the unholy trinity, consumerism, unrestrained capitalism, and individualism. And in our um, agreed court facts, and in the IPCC report, we see that the way the world is working now is leading us to death and destruction. And these the un the unholy trinity are, are driving this. Perhaps part of our ecological, theological conversion is to recognise these as beastly, idolatrous forces which should be resisted. Then, As we resist them, it's a type of spiritual warfare against the powers and principalities. As we pledge allegiance to Jesus, we, we need to name the beast and turn away from them. So let me go over a few aspects of how the injustice of consumerism, unrestrained capitalism and individualism um, are affecting the world today. So we're going to speak first about fossil fuels and capitalism. Climate breakdown is largely a product of our capitalist system, which prioritises profits over the well-being of people and the planet. As an economic ideology... Um, capitalism, and perhaps uh, perhaps I should say unrestrained capitalism, um, emphasises deregulation, privatisation, and the free market. Capitalism relies on constant economic growth, which is fuelled by the exploitation of natural resources and the labour of workers. This drive for growth is incompatible with the limits of the planet's resources and the need to reduce emissions. 
Pope Francis said that capitalism is in conflict with the earth. And in one interview, he quoted a 4th century bishop and he called the unfettered pursuit of money the dung of the devil. In the similar vein, the journalist Naomi Klein points out in her book, This Changes Everything, the logic of capitalism is fundamentally at odds with the needs of the planet. Capitalism is not only failing to solve the climate crisis, it is the very cause of it. End quote. Capitalism has created a situation where a handful of fossil, fossil fuel companies have amassed immense wealth and power. And they are the ones who are putting their foot on the accelerator at the expense of a stable planet. Let's take a closer look at the fossil fuel industry. According to a report by Carbon Major, Major's database, just 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global emissions since 1988. These companies, which include ExxonMobil, Shell, BP and Chevron, have knowingly contributed to climate change for decades, while also investing millions in campaigns to deny the existence of climate change and to obstruct progress towards reducing emissions. In the 1980s, ExxonMobil's own scientists warned that burning fossil fuels were contributing to climate change, yet the company spent millions of dollars funding climate denial campaigns and lobbying against climate regulations. These companies exist to make profit for shareholders. They wield in the world a, a dark, strange power. They are a mythic, beastly force. In Canada and the UK, the fossil fuel industry has immense power and is using this power to resist the changes that are necessary if we are to aim for a livable planet. This power is seen through their profit, the financial support it gets from the political establishment and the fact that it continues to expand the fossil fuel infrastructure against the warnings of leading scientists. Let's briefly look at Canada. In Canada, it's just looking at profits here, in Canada the combined profits from the five biggest oil and gas companies, Imperial Oil, Shell Calendar, uh, which include Imperial Oil and Shell Calendar, uh, Canada, was to the tune of 38.3 billion Canadian dollars. That's in 2022, making profits of 38.3 billion dollars. The vast majority of these profits are going to shareholders, not to redress the damage that they are doing in the world and not to be invested in green technology. Look at subsidies. The United Nations Development Programme, the International Energy Agency and the IMF are among numerous groups calling for an end to fossil fuel subsidies. These subsidies make fossil fuels more profitable and it's not as if they're going skint, is it? Um, these uh, subsidies make fossil fuels more profitable and do not encourage a switch to green energy. Oil Change International a research and advocacy group focused on getting the world off fossil fuels, recently reported that Canada provided more public financing for fossil fuels than any other G20 country, averaging $14 billion annually, annually between 2018 and 2020. So what a power they have. Um... And what governments could be doing, because the technology is already there, is putting subsidies on green energy, helping to move the market. If we look at expansion, um, everyone is, you know, leading scientists are all saying that 
you know, we need to end fossil fuels, and we've already got, you know, twelve years of uh, fossil fuel um, uh, supplies stored up. So what we don't need is any new coal, oil, and gas projects because they are almost certainly going against the Paris agreements and are, are showing a future, you know, in 2040, 2050, 2060, where there's still a lot of fossil fuels being used and we can't have that future. Um, and yet, Canadian oil and gas companies plan to expand production of oil and gas by nearly 30% from 2020 to 2030 which would lead to a 25% increase in associated annual emissions. Well, how can we re resist the beast of fossil fuel capitalism? I'm just gonna mention, uh, mention five aspects, but these are things that you can think about in your own time. Number one, reducing personal consumption of fossil fuels using public transportation. Um, reducing energy in the home, unplugging plug devices when they're not in use. Number two, supporting renewable energy. Number three, divesting from fossil fuels. Um, look to see what your own diocese, your own uh, church is investing in. And if they're investing in fossil fuels, call them to divest put pressure on them look at pension pots look at the banks who you're working with as well and take your money away from them give the fossil fuel industry less financial backing and power number four advocate for policy change by writing to your local regional and national political leaders for policies that do not support the fossil fuel industry and number five, holding fossil fuel companies accountable through lawsuits, protests, public campaigns. These can, these can raise awareness and pressure companies to change their ways. So Jesus lived in a world of economic injustice and he resisted the forces of domination, offered a new way forward. So in our own day and age, we should resist the beastly economic forces which are doing damage in the world. So I've mentioned unrestrained capitalism. Well, a close relationship to um, unrestrained capitalism is consumerism. Um, alongside the beast of unrestrained capitalism, or we might say fossil fuel capitalism, or neoliberal capitalism. It's a seductive allure, allure of consumerism. It's seduced us all almost from the, the moment we're born, through every advert that we have seen. Consumerism refers to the cultural and social phenomenon in, <coughs> in which the consumption of goods and services is seen as a central aspect of life and identity. Consumerism is characterised by a strong emphasis on materialism and a constant desire for the acquisition of new products and experiences. It's related to the sin of uh, greed. The more um, in 2015, the wealthiest 10% responsible for around half of global emissions because there's a relationship is there not between how much money people have and how much they consume and in their consumption how much uh, emission emissions it is causing the top one percent were responsible for 15 percent of emissions nearly twice as much as the world's poorest 50% who were just responsible who were responsible for just 7% that bottom 50% of the you know the world's poorest they're the ones who are going to feel the brunt of climate impact despite 
bearing the least responsibility for causing them. We'll look at a little bit more of that in a few minutes. As things stands, most people in wealthy countries are consuming in ways that are accelerating climate catastrophe. This isn't set in stone as we know that within wealthy nations there is great inequality between those at the top and those at the bottom. In the UK I think of those within the lighthouse community where, where pastor uh, many have low incomes, uh, never go on holiday, uh, don't fly, don't have a passport, they don't have the latest tech or clothing, they rely on food banks and don't have the financial resources to heat their homes. Um, you know, uh, in the in the UK, um, you know they're they're not high, living high carbon lifestyle lifestyles. Um, a similar thing uh, uh, is in Canada. According to uh, in in Canada, the forty four richest people have more wealth than the poorest twelve million, and the top one percent of Canadians own more than 25% of the country's wealth. That means that even within wealthy nations, it's a small part of those nations who are doing most of the emissions. Some analysts reckon that the richest 10% of Canadians are responsible for a quarter of the national carbon emissions. Now, I've mentioned that there's some problems with you know just you know judging entire nations if they're one and the same, but when you take into account the emissions from international shipping and aviation, the average person in the UK emits eight point five tons of carbon a year. And in Canada, that's 14.2 uh, tonnes. Um, now, I've been digging around a bit uh, on these stats, and they do vary depending on the specific source and the methodology of the analysis. So in the UK, 8.5 tonnes. In Canada, it's 14.2 uh, tonnes. Um, now, when we think of the rich, we might think of millionaires and billionaires with private jets and mansions. Um, and clearly, uh, uh, clearly they are, um, um, you know, li living carbon intense lifestyles. Um, before I give you this next next stat, let's just mind up. Ten percent were responsible for around half of global emissions. Top one percent were responsible for fifteen percent of emissions. So you got the ten percent. So 10% were responsible for half of emissions and the top 1% bear responsibility for 15% of emissions. Well, where do we stand as individuals? Are we in this 1%, 10%? Are we elsewhere? Where are we in the onion of the world when it comes to carbon emissions? Um, well, an income of 52,000 Canadian dollars, that's 27,500 uh, British pounds is enough to put someone in the world's richest 10% and 150,000 Canadian dollars that's 79,000 pound uh, you you know English pounds puts them in the top 1% this is again where we perhaps feel uncomfortable um, because many of us who are part of this course may well be those who are in the richest 10% in the world, who are responsible for half of the emissions. Now, if the richest 10% of the planet reduce their consumption to the average EU level, it cut global emissions by 30%. I'll just say that again. If the richest 10% of the planet reduced consumption to the average EU level, 
it had cut global emissions by 30%. It's tough, it's difficult. Let's take aviation. As soon as you fly, you belong to a global elite. More than 90% of people in the world have never flown. And just 1% of the world's population is responsible for 50% of emissions from flying. Greta Thunberg said this, the bigger your carbon footprint, the bigger your moral duty. While we certainly need systemic change, we need the church to renounce the allure of consumerism and carbon intensive lifestyles. The 1% and the 10% need to live simply that others may simply live. So I want to ask you and ask myself, what does it mean for us to live lives of self-giving, sacrificial love in terms of reducing our consumption? Thanks, John. Um, this is Alice here. And we're just going to spend a bit of time looking at climate breakdown, colonialism and structural racism. So... We can dig down a little further into wealth inequality and emissions by demonstrating that our contemporary situation of inequality is rooted in history and is an outworking of colonialism. Jeremy Williams, UK author, has written a really helpful book that I regularly use and go back to called Climate Change is Racist, Race, Privilege and the Struggle for Climate Justice. In his introduction, he lays out the three broad kinds of racism. Individual racism, where someone exhibits personal racist ideology or attitudes towards another person or people group. Institutional racism, where a public body is structured in a way that disadvantages people of colour. For example, um, an education system that benefits those who are from privileged upbringings and structural racism, patterns of disadvantage that emerge from the overall functioning of the global system, often accumulated over centuries. William says that a key feature of structural racism is that it is laid down over time. It's racism with deep roots, namely that of colonialism and white supremacy. This kind of racism is the way that climate change is racist. So a brief overview of some of these roots. From the late 15th century, Europeans joined the slave trade where they transported enslaved West Central and Southern Africans overseas. In North America, we also saw the aggressive acquisition of First Nations land, forcibly removing indigenous communities so that material resources could be extracted for the benefit of predominantly white settlers. This was followed by European colonisation of Africa, which developed rapidly from around 10% in 1870 to over 90% by 1914. European nations focused on taking over African lands, racing one another to their natural resources and establishing colonies they would hold until an international period of decolonisation began around 1914 challenging European colonial empires up until 1975. Contemporary inequity between the global north and the global south, or the developed and the developing world, can be traced back to colonial expansion, the historic abusive extraction of resources to benefit the elite and shareholders of Europe. Colonialism was racist, and its legacy has left a world which is structurally imbalanced. Where the roots of colonialism, white supremacy and injustice have thrived and grown. And the wealthier nations have been able to embark on a journey of modernisation and industrialisation earlier and at a greater speed than the nations which had been colonised. Williams says, Because of these historical power imbalances, Racism has already shaped the world's response to climate change. When action is delayed, or when targets are weakened in the global north, it's the world's black and brown populations that suffer greater harm. Weak climate targets 
our racist policies. And racism, whatever kind, leads to violence. Climate change, whilst nobody's fault, has been created by generations of privileged decision making, which has exalted the rich white nations and plundered the powerless. Like a rolling snowball effect, climate change triggers and acts as a threat multiplier of all global injustices, including posing a violent threat to indigenous peoples, nomadic tribes, women, children, the elderly, LGBTQ, and many, many more. Whether it's George Floyd suffocating or the drowning of the country of Bangladesh, they have suffered from acts of violence, direct or indirect, that come from underlying roots of inequality and colonialism. However, countries in the global south are not being passive in the face of such injustice. Take Ethiopia, for example. Environmentalism is at the heart of Ethiopia's um, national policy and strategy. In the 2011 National Plan, the country set a target to become a carbon-neutral, middle-income country by 2025, almost a decade before the net-zero target we talk about in the West. And in 2013, Ethiopia switched on Africa's largest wind farm at the time and built Africa's first fully electric cross-border railway to transport goods to port sustainably. Or let's look at Colombia, who recently elected its first left government with Francis Marquez as vice president. She is an Afro-Colombian climate activist from the age of 15 when she campaigned for an end... Um, to an illegal uh, gold mine. She was a single mother who worked as a cleaner who is now pushing through policies such as vowing an end to fossil fuel dependence, starting with a ban on fracking, offshore drilling and coal mining, as well as prohibiting any new exploration licences for oil projects. The global majority, despite doing the least to contribute to the climate crisis, are providing innovation and solutions, which seem to mirror some of the kingdom values that John's been talking about, of turning the power imbalance of the world on its head. Uh, Let's just observe these graphs. As we can see, um, it's the former colonised countries with populations predominantly of black and brown skin who are already suffering the worst effects of climate breakdown. Whereas the consumption rates per person per capita are much higher in the global north. Global responsibility for climate change is not equally shared. Young climate activist Vanessa Nakait advocates for loss and damage policies to be put in place, where rich nations cancel the debts of poorer nations and pay for the damage they have caused ecologically. Slavery and colonialism funded industrialization, and so are at the heart of climate change. And from a carbon footprint point of view, rich nations are indebted to the poor. Thinking of Jesus and the kingdom proclaiming the year of jubilee. We need to ask our leaders, will that debt ever be repaid? Thank you, Alice. Well, we're going to um, draw uh, this session to a close. We've covered a lot of material in this uh, session today. Uh, At the beginning, we looked how Jesus in his kingdom work offers a radical vision of the kingdom which has political and economic consequences. In a world of economic injustice and domination, Jesus sought an economic reset. The poor would be blessed and wealth would be redistributed. We then spent some time showing that we too live in a world of oppression, injustice and domination due to the strange powers of fossil fuel capitalism and consumerism. 
Furthermore, we have seen that current wealth inequality and climate vulnerabilities are built upon historic racial injustice and colonisation. And one of our tasks as the church is to recognise this injustice and work for the flourishing of all as a form of spiritual warfare and an outworking of our allegiance to Jesus, we need to resist, resist the beasts that are at work in the world and instead move towards kindness, compassion and justice. Let's end this session with a prayer entitled War to the Unholy Trinity. Thank you. Father of creation, God of compassion, you made a world full of possibility and potential. You declared it to be good. For this we give you thanks. To you be all honour and glory. Father of creation, God of compassion, there are strange dehumanising and destructive forces at work in this world of yours and this world of ours. Creation groans. Creation cries. Lord, have mercy. Father of creation. God of justice. Your church too has bowed the knee and benefited from these dehumanising and destructive powers. We have become entranced and enticed. We are compromised and have colluded. We have grown rich and our hearts have grown heavy. Lord, have mercy. Father of creation, God of justice, these dehumanising and destructive forces help to maintain our status quo and we have stood silent at the butchery of your world. At first unaware, but then deliberately we have walked down the other side of the road. And then at times we have acted as cheerleaders and chaplains to this unholy trinity. Lord, have mercy. And so we name the unholy beast. We renounce it, we repent of it. Unrestrained capitalism, consumerism, individualism, your days are numbered. This unholy trinity that oppresses the poor, ransacks the earth, dehumanizes, your days are numbered. This unholy trinity that offers entertainment, distraction and denial, your days are numbered. War. War. War to the unholy trinity, justice and mercy will kiss. The kingdom will come. Blessed are the peacemakers. And so, we pledge allegiance afresh to Jesus the butchered lamb and ask that in this time of climate breakdown we would be faithful to him, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be all praise, honour and blessing. Amen. Amen and Amen. <laughs>